the transformation that came from your body and your blood, we have eternal life through Christ Jesus. And we just want to lift up a shout of glory and praise to no other name. Can I get an amen and a cheer for Jesus? Amen, amen. You all may be seated.
Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces. The Holy Spirit produces. We don't produce. The pressure's not on us to make it happen. It's not through self-improvement or behavior modification or self-determination. It's the Holy, it's the Holy Spirit who produces. And so there's freedom here. And there's empowerment here. We're talking through a list of words that I know most of us want to grow in. Like we want these words to describe who we are, but it's a little intimidating. It feels a little bit frustrating because we've attempted, at least I have, I think you probably have too, you've attempted to improve in some of these ways and grow in some of these ways and yet it doesn't seem to happen, not the way we think it should or not to the degree that we would want it to, but it, it's, it's the Holy Spirit who produces. And so, so much of the series is unlocked when we get this part of it right. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against these things and Paul writes these words to new believers in the region of Galatia. And by new believers, I mean they are first generation believers. They didn't have examples of Christians to look to. There weren't um, other believers that had gone ahead of them to show them this is how you do it. And this is how you grow in these ways. And this is what the sanctification process looks like. They didn't have examples of becoming. Instead, they were blazing the trail. And Paul in Galatians just makes it clear that this happens through the Holy Spirit. And he gives them these words and says, look, these words should describe who you are. The, the longer you're a follower of Jesus, the more you should become like these things. And, and so if someone who doesn't know Jesus or follow Jesus, if they walk in here, they should see that this fruit is pretty obvious that it should be fruit that is growing in, in our lives. If you've been a part of the series and you've also noticed that we've added a condition to these different fruits that we're talking about to give a more clear indication that the fruit that we see in our lives is coming from the Holy Spirit and not from just our self-determination. So the example would be a couple weeks ago, we, we talked about joy that is for no reason. Joy when there's no reason. This condition helps us understand joy that comes from the spirit versus joy that comes from the flesh. Like the title of the series was not joy when you're on jet skis. If that was the title, then we're like, well, yeah, I can, I can have joy on a jet ski. It's, it's joy when there's no reason, when things aren't going your way, when life is difficult and things are challenging. When you have joy in that situation, you know it's coming from the Holy Spirit and not from yourself, right? Like you expect to see joy show up you know, at the beach or at the spa, or at a concert, but when, when the fruit of joy starts to pop up in places like a hospital waiting room, or a funeral home, or the uh, DMV, you know that it's not from within. You know that's coming from something more than you. Uh, it wasn't too long ago, I was at a park on a hot, humid day, didn't really wanna be there, and I uh, went over and sat down at a picnic table, Wiped the sweat off my brow. Just wanted, I didn't. I didn't. Want, I wanted to be in air conditioning. Is what I wanted. And I hear somebody whistling. I'm like, who is whistling on a hot, humid day like this? I look up. I see a guy walking towards me. He's got a hose over his shoulder, and I follow with my eyes the hose, and it's going to a uh, tank on the back of a truck. And I watch him as he whistles his way past me, and he goes to these porta potties to empty the porta potties. I'm like the gall of this guy coming on a day like this, empty and poor to potties, acting all happy and joyful. And, but what really got my attention was the song he was whistling. Uh, the song he was whistling was this. He, he, so he's walking, picture, he's walking past me, carrying this uh, hose and, and whistling. You know the song? Okay. Said, we got some singers, we got some whistlers, but yeah. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Like, really, bro? That's what we're, that's what we're doing? But what, what's he demonstrating there is joy when there doesn't seem to be any reason for it. And when, when he demonstrates joy on a hot, humid day, and his job is to clean out the porta potties, like that fruit becomes evident. Like, that, it, it's 
from the Holy Spirit. That's not from with him, in him, that's from what the Holy Spirit gives us. And this week's message is patience when you've had enough. That's, that is the qualifier. It's when, when you've had enough. And, and most of us know what it's like to have had enough. Like, how would you finish this sentence? Don't say this out loud. I've had enough of. How would you finish that? I've had enough of their complaining. I've had enough of their criticism. I've had enough of their passive aggressiveness. I've had enough of Democrats. I've had enough of Republicans. I've had enough of politics. I've had enough of disappointment. I've had enough of my job. I've had enough of the economy. I've had enough of news notifications. I've had, en- I've had enough. I've had enough. I was going to ha- do this as a little bit of group therapy. I was going to have you finish that sentence and all of us say it out loud. I've had enough of. You know why I didn't do that? Because a lot of you would say a name and I didn't feel like we needed that energy, <laughs> right? Like, I, I, a lot of us would say, I've had enough of, and it's a specific person that, that comes to mind. And, and, and maybe it would be your boss or a coworker or a roommate or a spouse or even your own child. Like I, you, you created a human being, but you've had enough of that human being. You've had enough of them. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, really simply, be patient with everyone. Be patient with everyone. It's, it's the everyone part that's so difficult. It's, it's not just some people, it's, it's everyone. And so all of us know what it's like to have had enough of someone or something. And, and for some of you, it takes a while to get to that point of having had enough. And for others of you, you wake up and you've had enough. Like before your feet even hit the floor, you've, you've had enough. The word patience in the Greek is the word uh, macrothumia. Macro means long. Thumia, which we would get words like thermostat or, or thermos, heat. Long heat, it's like this, it's a long fuse. It takes you a long time to get hot. That's what the word patience means. It is this God-given capacity to graciously accept, delay, trouble, suffering, or mistreatment. To graciously accept, delay, trouble, suffering, or mistreatment without getting angry, worked up, without getting hot, without getting upset. So how you doing with that? Sometimes patience is just overlooking an offense. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, 11, a wise person is patient. It's to your glory to overlook an offense. You don't even think about it. You don't even notice it. You're not an easily offended person. That's a sign of this Holy Spirit patience. Sometimes patience means reacting to frustration or an inconvenience with a sense of humor. Like people look at you and they're expecting you to be upset and they just see a little smile on your face and you shake your head Sometimes patience is accepting something you can't control. Sometimes patience means listening to understand rather than to be understood. Sometimes patience means loving someone the way they are. Even if they never change, you're still gonna love them and accept them. Sometimes patience means keeping perspective when you're just really disappointed. Sometimes patience is kindly thanking someone for something they did that quite frankly, they should have done a long time ago. Sometimes patience is deciding that God's timing can be trusted even though his calendar is not the same as yours. Patience is this consistent dedication. It's this commitment today, even though you might not see the fruit of it for years to come. It's patience. So how you you doing with that? When you've had enough, how do you react? Maybe that's a good question to ask someone in your circle. Like, how would they say you react? And here's why that's important, if I put this up on the screen. The fruit of the Spirit is evident in your actions, but it's impossible to ignore in your reactions, right? Like your reactions have a way of really revealing what kind of fruit has been growing in your spirit. More so than your actions, it's your reactions. It's when things don't go your way. It's when, it's when people expect you to to respond in a certain way because they know what you're dealing with or they know the way you've been treated and and they're expecting you to respond with anger and they're expecting you to respond by talking badly about the person or throwing, throwing your coworker under the bus because they know what your coworker did to you. They're expecting you to respond by being harsh and critical with your in-laws because they know the way your in-laws have treated you. They're expecting you to talk a certain way and treat your boss a certain way because they know the injustice that you've experienced at work. They know the challenges you've had with your roommate. And so when, when they know what you've dealt with and they're expecting you to react one way and you react with patience instead of bitterness, patience instead of lashing out, patience instead of rage, 
That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. James talks about this. James chapter five and verse seven, he talks about the need for perseverance and patience. He says, dear brothers and sisters, be patient. It doesn't say do patience. It's part of our problem. We think of patience as if I do these things and it creates some impatience in us. Instead, patience comes from the Holy Spirit. It becomes who we are and overflows out of us. He says, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Like, you're gonna need to be patient until Jesus returns. That's how long you're gonna have to be patient. Because you can be patient for one thing, and once that one thing happens, you're just gonna find that you're gonna have to be patient for something else. It's just from one thing to another until Jesus returns. Really, all of life is just being patient until Jesus comes back and says, okay, enough of all of these things. We're doing a series after this one, um, after this series called Keep Watch. And we're gonna go through for five weeks and we're just gonna talk about um, the return of Jesus and ask questions like, are we in the end times? And if so, how do we respond? And, and one of the ways we're gonna be challenged to respond is with patience, with this faithful patience until the day that Jesus returns. And then he gives this example of what it looks like to live this way. He says, consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring, and they eagerly look for the, valu- for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too, like the, like the farmer, you be patient and take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. And there's a few times in life, there's some seasons in life where we really need the Holy Spirit's help to be patient. Uh, I think... One of those would be just patience when circumstances seem unbearable. And I think what often makes circumstances unbearable is that they're uncontrollable. And we, we become impatient with these things that we want to be different, but they're not different, and we don't know what to do about them. We can't make them different. Maybe it's this one big thing that happens all at once, and you lose your patience because it's just, it's just too much to process. Or maybe it's this cumulative effect, one thing after another, after another, after another, and then you snap, and and where you snap, everyone thinks, well, that wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, why are you getting so upset in traffic? Well, there's a whole list of things that led up to this one thing, and the circumstances start to feel a little bit unbearable. About a week and a half ago, I had a surgery, uh, my second surgery on, on one of my eyes. So some of you will remember a few months ago, I had surgery on my left eye when I wore the sunglasses and preached with Dave. And you know, I was a little smarter this time and uh, took a couple of weekends off from preaching, but I had surgery on my right eye. And, um, and it's been, I mean, it's gonna be fine. Like I'll, it'll get better and I'll learn to manage with some things, but it's been a frustrating couple of weeks because you know, it doesn't bother me. It's not like it's painful. It doesn't bother me too much unless I'm looking at a screen unless I'm like reading or writing, you know, which is unfortunate because that's a lot of what I do. Like that's like half of how I spend my day is doing those things. And I, and I just have trouble with it. I can look at a screen for like 30 minutes and it just gets more and more blurry, kind of like looking at something underwater. And so I'm working on this patient sermon, but I'm having trouble seeing the screen not, not great, right? Like, so I go home Tuesday night, I go home a couple nights ago and I say to my wife, okay, can we, tonight, can we, when we're in Pienesters now, so we got time. I said, can we um, work on my sermon together? I'll dictate the sermon to you and you just type, type it up. And she's like, okay, yeah, I'm happy to, happy to help. And so we go to the couch, I lay down on the couch, she sits there, opens up the computer and she's ready to go, ready to type and, So I lay there and begin to write my sermon by speaking it, and so I say the first line of the sermon. This week we're continuing in our series called Becoming, and I hear her type a couple words, and then she says, are you sure that's how you wanna start? (laughs) And I knew it was a horrible mistake. But we push forward, we get a couple paragraphs into it, you know, my, my wife has the gift of, of wisdom and discernment. She is creative and hospitable and disciplined and determined. She has many wonderful things, but a fast typist, she is not. <laughs> she might've been in college. I'm sure she was in college, but that was going back a little ways. 
And I'm less than a couple paragraphs into this sermon on patience and I've got none left. I'm like, this isn't gonna work. I don't know what we're gonna do, but this isn't gonna work. And I, I just think most of us can, can relate to that. Like we, we, we know the way we want to react. We know the way we want to respond, but circumstances that are out of our control bring to the surface this impatience. It's not just circumstances. Sometimes it's, it's patience with people that seem un, unchangeable. People, patience with people that seem unchangeable. And so we, we keep waiting for this person to change. We've had enough, but we think, well, surely they're gonna, at some point, they're, they're gonna do things differently. Surely they're not gonna keep doing things the way they've been doing things. And, and the longer they don't change, the less patience we tend to have. And, and, and you just are tired of it, tired of the way they, they are irresponsible or immature, their procrastination or their the tone. You just get tired of it. A, a number of um, weeks ago, when we were in the marriage series, I, I came across some of this research by Dr. Uh, Gottman, who says that 68% of conflict in marriage is what he describes as unresolvable conflict, 68% of it meaning that it, at its core, is not going to change. It's, a, it's this personality difference that just is. It's not gonna be different. Or, or it's a situation with in-laws, or it's the reality of finances. And, and you, you, you can have all this conflict around it, but it's not gonna change. Like, that's, that's the way it's gonna be. And, and so he says, if 68% of the conflicts in marriage are, quote, unresolvable conflicts, then how do you find happiness in marriage? It's not by change or waiting for the other persons to change. It's by acceptance, which is patience. It's this accepting one another, as scripture talks about. It's this patient, having this patience with one another. One of the ways I know that I'm not keeping in step with the Holy Spirit, as we read about in verse 25, is that my fuse gets shorter. I get more irritated or more frustrated with somebody than would make sense than I should or would otherwise. A while back, I finished preaching, and um, a lady caught me after the service, and she wanted to let me know that I had used the word um, irregardless in a sermon. And uh, irregardless is not a word, I knew that, but it, apparently I used the word irregardless, and she explained to me that I should use the word regardless. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, and then she said, well, here's what I remember, Using the word irregardless is nonsensical. I'm like, okay, e easy. Okay, that, nonsensical, I don't know what it was about that, but it felt especially insulting. And, and so I, I'm listening, I smile politely, I thank her for her input, and I say something like, you know, thank you for helping me with that. I think most people understood what I meant when I said that word, but you know, irregardless. I, I, <laughs> and I said it with a smile. I said it with a smile, but she, I think, got the point and I knew what I was doing. Instead of being humble, I was prideful. There's this interesting connection between pride and impatience in scripture. That one of the ways you know you're proud and one of the ways you know you've got a pride problem is you've got an impatience problem. Impatience is always a sign of pride. And I was responding proud. I immediately went and I, I knew that irregardless was not technically a word, but I also know how the dictionary works, that once a word gets used widely and broadly enough, it becomes part of you know, the vocabulary. It gets put in the dictionary, and sure enough, it was in the dictionary. Irregardless <laughs> is in the dictionary. Some of you like, don't believe it, and I, but it's in there, irregardless of what you think. It's in there. <laughs> and, and so you know, I go find this afterwards, and I just all I could think about was I've got to tell her that it's, a dictionary, it's in the dictionary, that she's, she was wrong. And, and so I just decided at some point, I'm gonna work into a sermon that irregardless is technically a word that's in the dictionary. Now look, I, I feel like I've grown past that. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna work into a sermon that irregardless is in the dictionary. Number three, patience when God seems unavailable. For many of us, this is where patience begins to run out Spiritually, this is where our faith really begins to be a struggle for us is, is that we, we, we feel like we're in God's waiting room and it's okay for a while because we know he's busy, but then we start to 
recognize that there are people whose names are getting called who haven't been in there as long as we've been in there. And that doesn't seem fair and that doesn't seem right. And then somebody walks in God's waiting room and they don't even have to sit down. They just go straight back. And you're like, well, what, a, what about me? Have you forgotten about me? And sometimes we feel like we're in God's waiting room long enough that we, we start to lose faith, but that patience with God gets lost. Um, in scripture, the phrase, or the question rather, how long is asked, um, I believe, 65 times. Yeah, 65 times in scripture. You see this in the Psalm 20, Psalms 22 times alone. David says, how long, God? How long, how long, how long? And it's a pretty common question of God in scripture, even if it's not always spoken. You think of Abraham and Sarah and God says to them, hey, you're, you're gonna have the baby. But he doesn't tell them how long it's gonna be, he just says it's gonna happen. And they become more and more impatient. Time seems to be running out. They're past childbearing years. They finally decide we're gonna just take things into our own hands. Creates a whole mess. It seems to me that it would make more sense for God to say, hey, here's the promise and here's the calendar. Here's the timetable. You're gonna have to wait a while, but this is how long you're gonna wait. My friend compares it to going to Disneyland and at Disneyland when you're waiting in line, you'll see these signs that say your wait from here will be two days or whatever, right? Like they tell you this is how long, this is how long you've got. I'm surprised that that's the approach. You would think the best way to handle this would be to not let people know how much longer they have to wait until they get to go on the ride. But in fact, what they've learned is that people don't mind waiting longer. They just wanna know how long they have to wait. And I think that's how many of us feel with God. Like, okay, I can wait, but how long am I waiting? Just, just tell me. It would just be helpful if God would put up some signs and say, okay, you're unemployed. You've got, you've got a four-month wait. Okay, four, I can wait four months. You, you wanna be married, you, you've got about a two year wait. Trying to start a family, that's, that's, that's gonna be another three years. I, I don't mind waiting, I just wanna know how long I'm waiting and the way faith works is that we are asked to take these next steps of obedience and trust without knowing exactly how or when or what it's gonna look like. And we just see this throughout scripture. And so part of the kind of the uh, patience the Holy Spirit gives us is this, I'm, I'm okay for today. I'm gonna take the next step today. I'm gonna trust God's calendar today. It's interesting though. I was looking at that question, how long in scripture? And like I say, it appears about 65 times, but many of those times, it's not people asking God how long. It's God asking people how long. How much longer? It's God being patient with us. We see that throughout scripture as well. So having this kind of, of patience that comes from the Holy Spirit when we've had enough, one of the ways that you know you have this kind of patience is that you're waiting intentionally. You wait intentionally. You wait, maybe another way to think of this is purposefully. A lot of times, if we're thinking of patience, go back to our waiting room image, we're thinking of kind of sitting on our hands, flipping through a Sports Illustrated from 2010. You know, we're, we're killing time, we're watching the clock, we're scrolling on our phones, we're just, we're, just, we're just getting through it, waiting for our name to be called. What we see in scripture, what the Holy Spirit empowers us to do is, is to recognize that there's something happening in the waiting that's just as important as what it is we wait for. It's, it's this sanctification that only happens in the waiting room that God, God does something while we're waiting in us. And, the, and so the Holy Spirit is working in us while we wait so that when our name is called, when it's our time, that we haven't wasted that time, but like a farmer, James says, we've watered and we've cultivated and seeds have been planted, nothing's been wasted. Patience isn't sitting on your hands and doing nothing when there's an opportunity for something to be done, to prepare yourself. Patience, said another way, is not passivity. Patience is not apathy. Don't confuse those. Don't confuse that. Don't, don't think of yourself as patient because you don't care enough to look up from your phone long enough to do something or to say something. That's not being patient, that's being apathetic. Those are two different things. 
the Holy Spirit's patience isn't passive, it's purposeful, it's moving us towards becoming who God wants us to be. And for him, for God, that's, that's important. That's what's important. It's, it's, it's not just where we're going, it's who we're becoming along the way. And so again, we see this in scripture for Moses where he spends some 40 years in God's waiting room. He wants to be used by God in a significant way, but, but he has to have some things happen in him while he waits, God prepared. We see with Joseph, we studied his life not long ago where he spends 13 years in the waiting room. He had these dreams of, of what his life would be, if he'd be becoming this great leader. But, but there's this season where he's just waiting. And, and so here's what I want you to remember is that, that waiting is always part of becoming. Waiting is always part of becoming. We pray and ask God to make us more like his son, Jesus. In this series, we're talking about how do we become more at peace and more joyful and more kind and goodness. Waiting is always part of God's process of becoming. There's no becoming without waiting. James hits this pretty hard in verses two through four of chapter one. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that these trials, these difficulties, these challenges, these struggles, the, the testing of your faith produces what? It produces perseverance. It produces patience. And then he says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That there's something that happens in the waiting that allows us to become. And so we stay connected to the Holy Spirit he gives us patience, but it's not just this, I'm gonna make it through the day patience. It's I'm going to become who God wants me to be patience. I, I'm, I debated whether or not to share this last part with you, but I, I don't wanna use any names, but there's someone in my life right now that is just testing my patience. I, I, just, don't, I just don't feel like I have much patience left for him. I feel like I can't trust what he says. I've lost track of how many times he's promised me something and he hasn't followed through. I feel like sometimes he's ungrateful. He takes for granted things in his life and not, not to pile on. I think you know, sometimes he tries to act more spiritual than he really is. He has an incredible wife, but I, I hear the way he takes her for granted. I heard even recently that she was willing to type up his sermon for him and he had no patience, this guy. It's true. It's true for me these days. Some of you relate to this, but man, the person I have the most trouble finding patience for is me. And I lose patience with myself because I wanna grow in these ways and I feel like it's slow. And I wanna bear these kinds of fruit in my life and, and then it just doesn't seem to happen. And, and that lack of patience with myself, it almost always it turns into this shame and guilt that, that surfaces with this anger. I just, just sometimes have the most trouble being patient with me. And maybe that's where you are too. Yes. So here's, here's what I know. I know that whether you're struggling with patience with a, some other person or with circumstances, difficulties, challenges, or, or maybe it's with yourself, I know that the key to finding patience is to recognize how patient God has been with you and how patient he's been with me. I, I sometimes, I remember, especially when my kids were younger, seeing them get frustrated with themselves. And as a father, I'd kind of smile and like, it's okay. Hey, it's okay. And I picture God and his patience that he's this loving father. The Bible says that he's, he's slow to anger. He abounds in love. 
Bible says that his mercies are new. How often are they new? Every morning. Every morning they're new. And the Bible says in Peter, God is patient with you. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to come to salvation. God's patient with us. And when we begin to understand his grace and his patience with us, it gives us patience for ourselves, which we need. It gives us patience with other people. It gives us patience with life and circumstances that were, are out of our control. And so through the Holy Spirit, we are reminded that God is a patient father. He's been so patient with you. Let his patience Bible says, let his kindness lead you to repentance. Let his patience call you to him. Maybe you're asking God how long, but I wonder if maybe God is asking you that same question. How long? How much longer are you gonna try to do this on your own? How much longer are you gonna try to do this out of your own self-determination, out of your own behavior modification? How much longer are we gonna take this path? And the Holy Spirit is there. He's ready to produce this fruit in you if you surrender your life to him. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your grace that sets us free. I thank you for your power that gives us the strength that we need to do what we couldn't do on our own. I thank you, God, that you are a patient God and that you have waited on us um, out of your love for us. I, I pray, God, that, that that patience that you've demonstrated towards us would overflow out of us, that would give us patience with others and with ourselves and with just the challenges of this life. And so, God, in these next few minutes, even as we worship you, I pray that we would find strength in you, that, that our power would not be in ourselves, but would be in you, Holy Spirit, that, Holy Spirit, you would be the one who produces this fruit in us. Uh, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Till we hear the trumpet call.